I am going to start off with uh, kind of a brief overview with about 100,000 slides focusing on the guidelines in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and to try to raise some controversies or some points of discussion. And so we'll start off with beautiful downtown Nashville. I look forward to seeing all of you there at some point. This is a picture taken by one of our former residents who is a photographer who uh, actually uh, did his fellowship at Mayo. He's now in Austin, Texas, living the good life. Who's an expert? I've shown this slide before, so take a minute and take a look at this. We start off with um, the, the person at the, the beginning of their stage, early in their career, saying right now, I, I know nothing. Um, and, and that's a, a, a point that we'll get to because then you have the, the slide that's, uh, or the phase that's a little bit more concerning. I'm an expert phase. Uh, how much I think I know is very high, how much they actually really know is worse. And, and then you get to the point where with the panel discussion yesterday, I think we raised a lot of questions regarding the fact that we really don't know as much as we want to know and that we realize there's a much more that we really actually need to know. And I think that's what we're going to kind of of uh, hopefully tap into today regarding what we're going to be actually learning in the future. So uh, I was asked a couple times uh, yesterday about different kinds of guidelines, what we do and what we don't. I, I'm going to go over briefly uh, some of the guidelines, some of the areas of focus for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. These are guidelines really aimed for the urologic surgeons as opposed to the oncologist but it gives you an idea of, of kind of what we do. So if, if you ask most surgeons in the US, the guidelines they tend to look at, they may not pay attention to in terms of practice, but what they look at are the AUA guidelines with the focus on attempting to risk stratify, give a clinical framework for those patients, or for those physicians actually treating patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So goals of therapy, I, I think the top is to focus on those tumors and those patients that have more aggressive tumors, those that can actually impact their livelihood. But at the same time, I think we need to de-escalate. Uh, I, I think Seth mentioned yesterday the fact that we're, we're overdoing surveillance for many of these patients. Dr. Linhan also mentioned that. So we also want to avoid overtreatment and focus on the patient and ultimately risk stratify based upon not only the patient, but the patient's disease process. So a brief overview from Merck. In October of 2020, this was uh, a statement from Merck regarding the plans for their construction. They'll triple the current production, it'll be about five to six years, and it'll gradually increase over time. So since then, there's not been a public statement. So uh, myself and our fellows have actually had discussions with Merck. We're, we're going to actually put together uh, a GeoASCO kind of update uh, for the GeoASCO folks to talk about basically what is the update for Merck. Uh, and they have actually, I've just got an email literally from yesterday regarding their answers. So uh, in terms of when is this uh, facility going to be done, ground has been broken. Their statement is in three to four years, they should have the facility done. They currently make 600 to 800,000 plus vials per year of, of BCG. That output has been relatively consistent over the past few years. Demand went down during the pandemic and is now upticking. Um, they think that they will be able to ultimately triple their current production. So those are the statements put out by Merck. Really no different from the statement from uh, two years ago, um, but they think they're on course. We did ask some questions about distribution and, and how certain facilities can get it and, and that type of thing, and ultimately, the point that they made was that it is their same distribution process as what they've done for years and years, and it's up to the individual uh, kind of wholesaler and distribution uh, company that base their distribution on historical needs. And that was a, a direct quotation. So uh, this is actually uh, a guidelines that came out about five years ago that was updated a year and a half ago, uh, looking at non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, there are different ways and different methodologies. The top bars, the NCCN guidelines that the oncologists are very familiar with. Uh, within the world, the EAU guidelines uh, are, uh, are, are quite widely used, come out every year or so or every other year. The methodologies are quite different. The EAU is more of an expert panel discussion going through the evidence. The AUA uh, is evidence-based in terms of actually the recommendations and the level of evidence there. Um, but in terms of what they recommend, they're really not that different. 
So controversies was the second part of the title of, of my talk. I think some of these points here really don't raise any controversy. Perform a quality TRBT, individualize the care for that uh, particular patient using BCG appropriately, understanding the role of cystectomy, realizing that systemic immunotherapy is an option, and enroll patients in clinical trials. Also, I think without controversy are um, some key points regarding a quality TRBT. This is a slide I've put on uh, for years, actually, looking at the role of TRBT, what can be done, how can we do better, how can we make it easier for our pathologic colleagues that have a difficult time in terms of interpreting things. So if we look at blue light, uh, we have a, a discussion later this morning regarding its role and, and how it can be helpful in terms of pathologic specimens. If we give this to our pathologist, what can he or she do when they see a, a, basically a kidney basin full of tumor? Very difficult for them to differentiate. So whatever we can do to help our colleagues from a pathologic standpoint, as well as provide the best possible specimen and resection of tumor, I think is important. So uh, this is one of the things that we've been working on. We talked a little bit. We can turn down the volume there a little bit. Um, we were talking about specifically about unblock resection. What can we do? Uh, and this is uh, the next steps. I've actually presented some of this before early on. Um, this is one of my partners, Dr. Harrell, who is a co-founder of this company. And um, uh, we're now working on a, uh, a, a robotic model of endoscopy of actually through a rigid scope being able to manipulate uh, the instruments to in fact uh, hopefully allow a, a better uh, resection. Um, so we're, we're uh, actually now starting to um, uh, get this ready for uh, human investigation. We're looking at this for BPH uh, as well as for tumors. So when looking at enhanced cystoscopy, um, you would think that uh, it, it seems helpful. You, you, you have a techniques or you have techniques that can uh, actually have us be able to identify tumors at a, at a higher detection rate and perhaps decrease recurrence. Um, and if, if you look at the data, this is a review by Yer Lotan looking at actually comparisons of blue light versus white light cystoscopy, clear differences in recurrence rates and the number of tumors found uh, for both papillary and CIS tumors. So you think there wouldn't be really controversy, except um, as with medicine, we were always looking at evidence, looking at updates, and this was a recent paper that came out uh, within the past few months, looking at a comparison of blue light versus white light, uh, with the fact that there didn't seem to be a difference at the three-year recurrence-free rate between blue light cystoscopy and white light cystoscopy. Um, we can have a whole separate uh, discussion regarding the pros and cons of this study. Um, my bottom line take is I, I think those individuals that utilize blue light cystoscopy, and if I'm a patient, why would I do anything to avoid or, or not utilize the best possible way to optimize tumor resection and tumor identification? Um, and so I, I, I think that those in the current situation and current landscape, those that utilize blue light cystoscopy will continue to utilize blue light cystoscopy. Uh, those that have not made the conversion in the U.S., this may give them time to pause and think, but uh, I think, again, utilizing any technique to enhance resection, I think, would be helpful. So risk stratification. The, the issue with any risk stratification is an attempt to simplify, to help identify and uh, allow treatments that are best adapted for patients. The problem with risk stratification is obviously those that are on the fringes of each group, you're going to be able to find outliers that really don't necessarily fit, that may be lower risk or in fact may be higher risk. Um, but uh, in fact, in looking at this, and this was the first attempt, this was put out when we put out the initial guidelines in 2016, 2017, um, this really actually attempt to codify. We moved away from the index patient to this table. And when looking at its ability to risk stratify, the nice thing about uh, the, the table that we'd set up is it does risk stratify for not only recurrence, but also for progression risk. Uh, and so uh, this shows the, the ability that by using those categorizations, you, you're able to, in fact, give an idea regarding the risk of tumor. Uh, let's see if I can go ahead and play this. This is actually put together, an app put together by J. 
Chad Rich, who is a member of our um, guidelines panel, and I'm going to hit play. And this is an app available at BLATUR. It's endorsed by the AUA that basically gives you a clinical situation. Uh, and as you go through it, you basically identify certain characteristics of the tumor. If it's greater than three centimeters, you look at the stage, you look at the grade, and then you describe the focality and the certain high-risk features that this patient may or may not have. And you think, okay, well, it gives you an idea of this is a high-risk patient. You would think you would know that. It gives you an idea of the recommendation based upon the guidelines. And then I think in addition what's helpful is it gives uh, the clinicians as well as patients the ability to understand, hey, there might be a clinical trial available. So it automatically then takes you to clinical trials that may be actually, in fact, specifically focused on your cancer risk and those that might be available. So uh, as the AUA goes, the EAU goes, and as the EAU goes, the AUA goes, there's a lot of overlap. And so the EAU guidelines look very similar to, to the U.S. guidelines, although they have broken out the high risk into a, 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 high, a very high risk group based upon certain risk factors, age, multifocality, and size of tumors. Nothing is perfect. You think that high-grade TA tumors less likely to progress, but maybe perhaps a higher chance of, in fact, um, recurrence. Uh, this is a, a study from MD Anderson looking at the fact that actually high-grade TA tumors, if they're unresponsive, they can be, in fact, quite dangerous. Uh, almost 10% can lead to or move to muscle-based disease, and more than 10% required cystectomy of this MD Anderson series. Uh, more recently, there's been a, a controversy regarding the intermediate risk. I mean, to me, that makes a sense. You've, you've got a bucket with low risk. You have a bucket with high risk. The intermediate risk group, you can have 10 categories, five categories, three categories. There's going to be a group that tends to be more of, of, of those that will have disparities within that individual group. Uh, and so this is uh, based on a collaborative review looking at different ways to break out intermediate risk category. Uh, is it helpful? Uh, is it, in fact, um, guide, guidance in terms of therapy? I think it makes a lot of sense. The, the evidence rigor regarding this is, is not as high, um, and this will definitely need to be uh, validated in the future. But any way we can to help identify and, and understand the best treatment for that individual patient, I advocate and I laud. The issue becomes, uh, I think, that we do need more evidence to support this, and also we need to make it easier for clinicians. We can't have 20 or 30 different risk strategy groups to, to help identify treatments for each patient. So any attempt to codify with a table is going to have some, some patients that may or may not fit quite well. So, and there are different ways that they show treatment risk. These are the NCCN guidelines which again tend to be used much more predominantly by oncologists as opposed to urologists. I think academic urologists look at the NCCN guidelines quite a bit. If you ask anyone in practice how often they use the NCCN guidelines, I think it would be the, the, the significant minority of patients or, or physicians. So that was the NCCN guidelines. If you look at the AUA guidelines, this is an algorithm that's iterative. It takes you through treatments and how you respond and then where you go next. And let's talk about a high-risk patient. So this is a patient uh, with an eight-month history of irritative symptoms, Symptoms uh, include uh, lower urinary tract symptoms, microscopic hematuria, and I'm going to underline smoking because one of the things that we, we won't really talk about during this meeting but that I wanted to reemphasize uh, is, is the fact that for these patients that have high-grade TA disease, you're thinking about cancer, what to do, you know, what we really need to focus and not forget about is the role uh, and the importance of smoking cessation. Uh, and so uh, there is some evidence that, that's out there looking at the role that urologists specifically have in terms of being able to influence at least an attempt to quit smoking. Uh, and this is actually a website um, looking at uh, possible ways to aid patients in that role. Um, this is a website we actually pass on to all our patients uh, that smoke, uh, and, and we need to do better. So for higher risk disease, 
um, the, the very high-risk disease and high-risk disease, uh, the AUA recommendations and the EAU recommendations are quite similar. Uh, here are the high-risk factors that I pointed out before. So what about, and we touched on it yesterday regarding when no BCG is available. Um, actually, uh, in the panel coming up, Dr. Tyson will have some, some case presentations that may hit on this. Uh, and there's going to be uh, discussions that will, in fact, follow regarding what they are, what they may be, uh, and what alternatives are there out there. But within the AUA, uh, the real focus when the BCG uh, shortage was really, uh, really much of an issue, and that's been cyclical, but a few years ago, an AUA white paper came out looking at the role of intravesical chemotherapy as a first-line option for patients with intermediate risk disease. Um, and importantly, no single agent intravesical has been approved for bladder cancer treatment in decades. So to individualize care, we have alternatives. Is there a controversy on what we do and what we use? Yes, because there's no standard regimen that's currently recommended. We know BCG is currently still being over and underutilized. And tumor heterogeneity is quite significant within the individual patient, within the population. So what we choose and what we have continues to be controversial because we don't have anything that is clearly the best. So one option that people have discussed, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Cates, Max Cates, has a trial that is going to hopefully be enrolling patients soon, is looking at the role of gemcitabine and docetaxel. And this is data focusing on those patients who were BCG naive. In other words, no exposure to BCG, some, a small percentage, uh, less than 10% had previous intravesical therapy. And looking at the combination of sequential gemcitabine and docetaxel. And in looking at this, um, a recurrence free survival at two years of two out of three, a significant response rate for these patients with higher risk disease. Also out there is chemohyperthermia, uh, not available in the U.S. This is a combination of, of actually treatment that will elevate the temperature uh, within the bladder and then give a chemotherapy agent. In this uh, particular instance, it's, it's uh, mitomycin C with a similar recurrence-free survival rate of actually closer to three out of four in these patients actually with intermediate to high-risk disease. An update regarding chemohyperthermia, at least in the U.S. Uh, and, and in elsewhere, there, there, there's a lot of unknowns. Trials have been put out there, recruitment status unknown, recruitment status withdrawn, concerns about safety issues. Um, in Turkey, uh, a, a trial was completed more than uh, four years ago. No results have been reported. Um, the U.S. trial that was started um, back actually more than two years ago, almost five years ago, was terminated. The, the rationale was actually poor enrollment. There is a single trial um, uh, from Hong Kong. They were waiting results. I don't know if that's been reported out. I don't know if Peter or Josh know, but that's uh, been completed, and we, we wait the results. So don't forget cystectomy. Uh, it's curative. And I love the quotation that, that, that uh, Seth had yesterday about the, the CR rates with cystectomy being 100%. It, it really is important, understanding specifically for those patients with higher risk disease, that cystectomy really should be uh, uh, foremost on our list of possible treatment options. So a key update in the 2020-2021 update was uh, uh, looking at specific things, understanding that uh, the role early on for high-grade T1 diseases after a single course of induction to proceed to offer radical cystectomy, uh, understanding some of the very high-risk features, BCG unresponsive, variant histologies, lymphovascular invasion, and prostatic urethral invasion. So these very high-risk features from the NCCN are slightly different from the EAU, EAUs, but also add another layer of attempting to identify risk within individual patient populations. So uh, that's that category we just talked about. When it comes to variant histology, it, it clearly is a grab bag. or it, it, We don't know what's going on in terms of what is the best treatment options. We have an idea regarding certain of these histologies, but we're putting them and lumping them into, into one group. 
clearly the more we learn about micropapillary or plasmacytoid or nested variants, we're going to hopefully be able to better identify particular treatments. Um, multiple issues make this difficult, including the limited number and small number of these patients. Also understanding that we really don't know necessarily response rate to different types of systemic therapies. So the more we understand, and perhaps actually Donna may mention something about, the more we understand the molecular basis as well as treatment options for these patients, the better we'll be able to identify treatments. So this is a variant histologies. Right now within the AUA guidelines, it's to really consider initial radical cystectomy. So many patients still receive BCG. What do we do if it's not worked? We've, we've got uh, talks coming up looking at different types of salvage therapies. This is a definition here in terms of what's going on. We've got cystectomy, chemotherapy, and systemic pembrolizumab with future regarding possible intravesical therapies. So this is just a general slide. Uh, we'll continue to be, uh, need to be updated regarding salvage options, intravesical, investigational, systemic, looking at different types of agents, uh, and that this is just only a partial list. So again, a partial list of salvage chemotherapy options. You see the uh, gemcitabine docetaxel. That I've showed you data regarding for BCG naive, clearly is being looked at uh, and has been looked at for BCG unresponsive. And what about systemic immunotherapy? Uh, I think you all are all familiar with this. I won't spend too much time regarding this, but this is actually looking at the role of systemic uh, pembrolizumab for those patients who are BCG unresponsive. And you see a complete response rate of uh, about 40% at the three-month right, uh, with a median duration response of almost a year and a half. Um, this basically led to FDA approval uh, and inclusion within the guidelines for those patients with unresponsive disease with CIS, with or without papillary tumors, who are un ineligible or have elected not to undergo cystectomy. So that's the update there. It's been somewhat slow in terms of the uptake uh, with practicing urologists. Uh, different concerns have been raised regarding the overall relatively low complete response rate, um, autoimmune uh, adverse events or uh, um, immunotherapy adverse events, no clear predictors at this point of who would respond and, and the cost associated with the treatment. But it is FDA approved uh, and it does remain an option for certain individuals. So more controversies, um, haven't even touched base specifically on what the answers are, but if you look at how we risk stratify, what do we do, a lot of controversies regarding how we look at grade. Should we stick with the low grade, high grade? Should we go back to one, two, and three? What about the intermediate risk subcategories? Clearly that's the kind of the big group in the middle that that different treatments may be better for those different individuals. Who are high risk, who are very high risk? Surveillance, how often, how rigorous? We talked about urine markers yesterday, perhaps obviating the need for cystoscopy. Do we use blue light? Do we use white light? Should we use flexible blue light cystoscopy? All things to consider regarding the role of surveillance and its ability to identify those patients who are truly at risk versus those who may have a nuisance tumor versus those who have no tumors at all. And for the clinicians, you know, how we define regarding what is um, BCG exposure, what is BCG unresponsive, what is BCG refractory, those are, those are terms in, in essence we've attempted to, in some ways, we, we, we just put terms to conditions in attempt, again, to risk stratify. So the BCG shortage is going to, uh, I think, is going to be around the intermittent shortage, the intermittent, intermittent inability for at least a few more years, if not longer, uh, unless, uh, as we will talk about uh, this morning, alternatives and, and BCG alternatives, et cetera, uh, if, if they become more wide place or, or widely available, that may change. Systemic therapy now is available for those patients with BCG unresponsive disease that's not muscle invasive. Importantly, that has bred a number of clinical trials uh, to look at systemic therapy either by itself or in combination with other agents placed in the bladder. 
And exciting options obviously continue to exist now, looking at uh, what's going to be available for patients, either intravascular and or systemic. Uh, but then the question is, what will the FDA approve? I, I've, I had some slides going over those intravascular agents that have looked promising and have promising data that unfortunately haven't yet had FDA approval. Uh, and if they do become approved, clearly we'll give uh, a real alternative to our patients. Further improvements are going to need to be made regarding risk stratification. Uh, some of the talks this morning will really look at having a deeper dive into those um, patients in terms of their disease process and the risk that's involved. And clearly it's an exciting time looking at um, diagnostics, risk stratification, uh, looking at the role of imaging, uh, as well as discussions we had yesterday regarding tumor markers, either liquid biopsy, quote unquote, urine markers, quote unquote, giving us an idea of truly uh, what's really out there in terms of being able to identify those patients who are at risk, those patients who may have a recurrence, or those patients where we can de-escalate therapy. So uh, I think this is my last slide looking at the importance of risk stratification, combination of intravascular or systemic therapies or them or each of those therapies used individually and then future improvements in terms of tumor resection and then identification of actually prognostic biomarkers. So I will end there.